uh, this guy skated or that uh, justice wasn't served or there's a bunch of liberal lefties on that jury. These people were just like you and I, including all of you people who are raging right now because of the verdict. They include you, and if you didn't follow the law, I'm not saying you had to pay him to come to this verdict, but I don't know what other verdict you could have come to. So, I think there are a lot of things that people don't necessarily understand about the designation, not criminally responsible, but one of the things that we do know is that the federal government has uh, come out with legislation to make things uh, a little harder. If you're designated not criminally responsible, they're going to designate perhaps you a high-risk designation, and that would mean it would be tougher for you to get out, and also tougher for, easier on the family. Right now, the family would have to go once a year to find out if you were going to be released, and if you're given a high-risk designation, it would be every three years. But you know, as much as it has been presented that these people get in there and they're out in a year, truth is, most of them do 10 years. Most of them do 10 years, that's the truth. Now, I have questions about the fact that if you kill somebody with a gun, you would get out of jail and then perhaps you would be on parole. But in some cases, when you're designated not criminally responsible, you can get out of jail and you're scot-free and there's no way they can keep track of you. Dr. Johan Brink joins us right now. He's co-chair of the Canadian Forensic Mental Health Network, and he represents an organization uh, along some of the people who are against the Conservatives' new designation of not criminally responsible. He thinks it's a little too harsh. And Dr. Johan Brink joins us right now. Uh, Dr. Brink, thanks for your time. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me, Jim. Okay. Um, so here in Toronto, obviously, we are, uh, many people are concerned about the designation of not criminally responsible. You don't like the fact that the government would like to make things uh, a little tougher for people to get out. Tell me why. Well, firstly, let me thank you. Uh, that is not correct. It's not that we don't like it. We feel that the current legislation um, has adequate protections already in law to ensure that people who continue to be risky to the public remain in hospital. Um, what we do say is that uh, uh, the the uh, provisions to 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 um, make the public safer uh, have all sorts of holes in them. And I'll give you one example, and that is that um, we anticipate that there is a very real risk that people with mental illness will not opt for the NCRMD, not criminally responsible defense, but will rather plead guilty going to jail where they may not have to take treatment they will serve their time and they will come out of prisons just as ill and just as dangerous, if not more dangerous. So I want to make that clear to people. You're concerned that, let's say, I've committed a crime and that I could be designated criminally not responsible and perhaps I would get out after, um, I, don't, I don't know, under this legislation, three years. I wouldn't go for that designation because I could get out earlier and um, not actually get help, and I could get out and still be as dangerous. That's correct. That's correct. But, so, but, but the fact of the matter is, would I use uh, criminally not responsible in a crime that was not that serious? I mean, we're not going to, if I was locked away for 10 years for killing somebody, uh, then uh, who would care? Well, uh, one recommendation that we do make is that the NCRMD defense only be available to people who have committed serious, more serious offenses. Um, but yes, uh, we understand. We understand the, the 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 public's concern about this. The fact is, though, that that people who have a major mental illness, who are so ill at the time that they have lost contact with reality and that they are therefore in law not criminally responsible for their actions, they belong in hospital. They have an illness that requires treatment. 
and uh, it should be in a secure hospital setting, a yeah. secure forensic hospital. You know, one of our hosts here at the News Talk Center, again, we're joined by Dr. Johan Brink, he's the uh, co-chair of the here, uh, is concerned that uh, the designation, as soon as you get in there, that people are tripping over backwards to uh, see how they can get the guy out. The fact of the matter is, the barometer for allowing the person to get out is public safety, is it not? It is. It is indeed. So, do you, so, you know, we keep on giving these examples that someone who kills somebody, they could be without, in, with, they could get out within a, a year if they're deemed to be okay. The fact of the matter is these guys usually don't get out for about 10 years. Is, is that not accurate? Uh, yes, it varies by province. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, in British Columbia, we, we have people uh, who've been here for 30 and 40 years, simply because they remain dangerous and, uh, and, and, and nobody uh, deems them to be so when they do, I think people would be okay with the fact that you get out eventually if we knew that there was, I don't want to say tight leash, but we knew that the people had checked in with, say, a social worker or something like that, and we made sure that they were taking their meds. I'm reading a report that the Canadian press put out in, uh, tw in 2012 that once you get out, there are no checks and balances. After you get out of, uh, out of a hospital when you've been designated not criminally responsible, that there's no way to check up to make sure that person's taking uh, their meds. Is that accurate? That's not accurate. Uh, that is not accurate. Um, you're, uh, if you're released under conditions, there are certain conditions that attach. If yeah. you are deemed to be dangerous, like a Vince Lee or something like that, the chances are that when you do get out, there will be conditions. So anybody, including Richard Kashkar here in Toronto with the death of Sergeant Ryan Russell, he would probably have strict conditions associated with any release whether it's, you know, next year or 10 years from now. Yes, it's important to note that the review board can either order continued detention in a hospital or can discharge the person on conditions or can discharge the person unconditionally. And that is where the person no longer poses any threat to the public. How and then they are new people and do they ever um, recommit crimes? <laughs> Well, I can tell you that uh, they commit, recommit crimes at a rate that is significantly lower than people with mental illness who come out of prisons. It's five to six times lower for people who come through the, the, the review board system, the NCR system. So it's because of the treatment that they get. And not just medication, all the other needs are attended to. And as they are released under the current legislation, it is un under strict controls in a highly strictly supervised manner. Okay, I've got to run along here, but you're saying that you, if you're put in jail and you have a mental illness, that you're more likely to come out and recommit than if you are put in a hospital with the designation of not criminally responsible, correct? That's correct. Right. That's what the research shows. I thank you very much for your uh, input and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Dr. Johan Brink is the co chair of the Canadian Forensic Mental Health Network. They're a little concerned about the new conservative legislation. Straight ahead, the other side. Tim McLean was the man who tragically had his head cut off in the back of a Greyhound bus. His mom is going to join us straight ahead to weigh in on the cash car verdict next. It's 2.46 and separated from the New South 10, 10 times over traffic. Well, it's crowded on the 401 already eastbound from the 427. Judge, if it's a sense of trial of the jury, don't abdicate their responsibility to the experts. They have an obligation to consider the opinion of the experts. They don't have to agree with it completely. They can reject part, all, or you know, accept none of what, what is said by an expert. But when you have uh, competing experts, uh, in the case of, an, of not criminally responsible, there is uh, an onus on the person raising the defense to establish it on the balance of probabilities, so that, in a sense, the, uh, the opinion favoring not criminally responsible has to be more persuasive to the trier fact, has to be more persuasive to the jury than the other opinion. So it, it can be competing, but the jury ultimately has to make that decision. Would the Crown have had the right in this case, after it received the opinion from its forensic psychiatrist supporting the defense position, 
to send a second forensic psychiatrist potentially to get a different opinion? Could have attempted to. Uh, that, you know, there's a requirement, or at least generally speaking, there's a requirement uh, on a practical level that the defense cooperate and the accused cooperate with one opinion being sought by the, uh, the Crown. Uh, I'm not sure whether you could ever be criticized for saying you had your one opportunity. Yeah, you know, a second. yeah I'm not aware of that ever, Ryan. An interesting question, isn't it? It is an interesting question, but it, the fact of the matter is, is I think the, the public should have additional confidence in the cash card verdict because not only did the defense psychiatrist support the defense, but the highly qualified expert chosen by the Crown conducted an independent forensic psychiatric assessment and came to the same conclusion. So we didn't have a contest of experts. We had unanimity. Let's move to the future because, as we know, uh, the federal government, the Harper government, has proposed changing legislation relating to not being responsible findings while potentially moving from an annual review to a three-year review for high-risk individuals found to be not only really responsible. I, I want to start the discussion by referring to comments made by Dr. Sandy Simpson on Canada and this week after I appeared on the show relating to the cash card case. So how might this affect cases in the future? The proposed changes to the law, three major changes. One is the greater involvement of victims of notification uh, and ensuring that the review boards consider the needs of victims. And that's an area that comes of the support uh, and those of us who work in the sector support those changes. Two other areas of changes. One is a change to the definition that applies to everybody under the NCR regime, which tightens uh, the controls in those areas. The third is the establishment of a high-risk patient category. Uh, and that is determined on the, on the brutality of what you've done or the risk that you pose. The problem with that is that the, that the concerns for public safety that these awful and brutal events generate are not necessarily correlated with the risk people have going forward. And so it's a crude indicator of how dangerous you are into the future. That's terribly hard at times for the families to make things to understand. And I think we're talking past one another a bit in that area because that package of changes, the changes from the definition and the high risk category, are likely to make the NCR less popular. And that may drive people away from it and into the jails. Have a rich hotel and much higher risk than they would have earned on the NCR ratio. That falls as concern. Brian, uh, as you consider what, what Dr. Stinson says here, and he is a senior forensic psychiatrist associated with the KMH, the leading mental health institution in this province, essentially saying two important things. One is that the brutality of the crime may determine whether or not someone is a high-risk patient, which will determine their investigation, but there may not be a connection necessarily whether or not they are a future public danger. And secondly, because of that change in the definition, defense lawyers on behalf of their clients are going to be resistant to bringing these kinds of applications and, and taking their chances with just conventional prison sentences, and then you're going to have seriously, mentally ill people, psychotic people, serving prison sets and not being where they belong. Not only do I agree with that criticism of the proposed legislation, but I think that the proposed legislation, as it relates to the notion of a three-year review as opposed to an annual review for these high-risk offenders, this conceives the whole concept of mental illness, uh, because it really, in a sense, creates a punishment for a brutal crime, uh, nevertheless committed by someone who's not criminally responsible, as opposed to the normal annual review where a carefully chosen group of people representing the community with legal backgrounds, with psychiatric and psychological backgrounds and members of the community very carefully on an annual basis take a look at what's happened in that year. And in many ways the annual review is able to monitor progress but also monitor problems and monitor problems with the treatment, monitor problems with respect to the failure to advance and progress. 
And that annual review in my uh, position would be a protection for the community. I think what, what's really a misconception, and the government spokesperson said the victims are concerned that their safety is not being specifically taken into consideration by review boards when they make a disposition. Well, I can tell you from a personal experience, and David's experience and my experience, our partner Sharon Levine has for at least seven or eight years been on the Ontario Review Board and also a chair of that board. We see on an ongoing basis the care that's taken in ensuring a fair and open hearing, the care that's taken in ensuring that victim families are fully heard and make representations, the care that's taken in coming to conclusions that protect the public safety uh, and yet encourage the mentally ill who have made progress to continue to make progress so that there is this careful balance that I uh, would suggest is best monitored on a yearly basis, not an every three-year basis, where we don't give any hope uh, for rehabilitation during that three years, and it creates almost a period of return. And I just want to add to that, but what really strengthens your point more than anything is the much lower recidivism among people who are found in CR and ultimately released than people who are convicted and then reintegrated and released back to the community. And it's significantly lower, and studies determine that. So why is there the need, then, to change the legislation? I would agree with that. There's also a misconception that people who are found not criminally responsible will invariably get out earlier than they would have had they been convicted and served their sentence. My father, who, before he became a judge, was a defense lawyer, and he often told me the story of a client who, in the 70s, treated uh, not guilty by reason of insanity to a sexual offense for which he'd been offered five years. He's still in the system. Right. Now, and I was I appeared before your father as a judge three times, and he was a great judge. But I fully agree with you, David, that if he found our client guilty, he was going to impose a very heavy sentence. Merciful day. He was a merciful day. And, and let me also say, when I was a law student, which is now uh, more than 40 years ago, uh, we had a very innovative course that was taught by the late Hans Moore. And Dr. Moore was the first person at a law school who wasn't a lawyer to teach in a law school environment. It was called a law Law and Psychiatry, and Dr. Moore uh, renamed the Law and Psychiatry the Bad and the Mad. And he would take us to the Oak Ridge section of uh, Penetang Machine, and we would tour it as students. And I'll tell you, there were people in there that had been there 20, 30, 40 years, and they weren't going anywhere. All right, when we come back, we're going to change topics. We're going to look at Amanda Knox, gay marriage in the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court of Canada ruling on wiretap provisions needed for text messaging. The time is 4.45. Time for a look at News Talk 1010 Time Saver Time. I'm going to still slow growth. We're heading out of downtown to about Park Side, right outside of the DVP. That's still slow as well. From the dog mills up to York Mills on the west.